Please stand for our call to worship. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away and you comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the nations. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Shout aloud and sing for joy, O royal Zion. For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church. We are so glad to have you here today and we hope that you will, if you're not a member, you will find a church home here, either online or here in person. Um, there on the back of the bulletin, there are many announcements. Things are going along, coming along this week. One of them I wanted to point out to you is that on Wednesday night, we are going to have our traditional Thanksgiving dinner which is always a treat to have here at church. 
So if you are interested in a, coming to this dinner, uh, please contact the office, or you can even drop a little note in the offering plate today. And the other thing I wanted to point out to you is on the inside, there's some information about Compassionate Hands. And they, we will be starting to host on December the 1st. But what is really important, if you could possibly help, there is a wish list. And these items are listed. And uh, Robin, is there going to be a specified box outside? Um, so if you look through this list of things that the ladies are going to need, um, it would be wonderful if you could contribute them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. We long to live as the people of God, yet in the very depths of our lives, we know that we do indeed hurt those around us with our words, with our actions, as well as our indifferences. But God hears us when we call. God answers with the grace that we need. So let us now make our confession to God. Let us pray together. God of wisdom, you give us words of truth, but we fail to listen. You give us signs of faith, but we refuse to see. You give us the opportunity to testify in your name, but we choose to remain silent. Forgive us our many sins, we pray. Forgive us when we follow false teachers. Forgive us when we presume that you will abandon us. Furnish us with the endurance to run the race of faith so that we may be your people forever. Amen. Our assurance of pardon. When we confess our sins, we become open to the promise of God's salvation. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Redeemer. May all we do, we do in his holy name. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. November the 11th is recognized in our country as Veterans Day, a day to remember 
and honor all those in our nation who have served in the military uh, in different capacities. And so today, the Sunday following the 11th, uh, I would like to take a few moments now and remember the veterans of our church and our lives um, with a prayer. Um, and before I do, there, there's one name that's not on there, and I discovered this after um, we had already printed this up and we'll put it on in future years, but that is Elmer Marler. Um, Elmer doesn't have any family. Elmer died about four years ago. Um, but when Elmer was in the military, he was part of the um, Normandy invasion. So uh, one of the great things that our military has done. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks for the veterans among us, those living, and the saints who have gone before. Help us be humbled by their service and their sacrifice. And we pray especially this day for actively serving members of the uniformed services. And we ask for your protection over them and their families. Guide us, Lord, as we seek to love our neighbors who are veterans and render them honor. Heal the brokenness of this world and bring us together as your people. And lead us, God, to work together towards the pursuit of your promised reign when nation shall not lift sword against nation and neither shall we learn war anymore. And all the people said, Amen. I hope you'll take a moment and read the names that are on our list. I invite you now to join with me in our prayer for illumination that's printed in your bullets. And let us pray together. Guide us, O Spirit by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find wisdom, and in your will discover your peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our reading today comes to us from the 21st chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Jesus is with his disciples in Jerusalem. They are standing in the courtyard of the great temple there. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, as for those things that you see here, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another, all will be thrown down. They asked him, teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And Jesus said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first but the end will not follow immediately. And then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places, famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. 
you will be betrayed, even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. This is the word of the Lord. the children to come forward, please. Somebody's spending the weekend with Grandma, huh? Yeah. And let's see, so uh, did you have something good for breakfast? Pancakes, cereal, jello? No? Probably something healthy like eggs, potatoes. Yeah, pretty good, huh? Uh, I'd ask for pancakes next time. Waffles, even. You like waffles? Oh, I like waffles, too. Okay, speaking of waffles, what is this? It's a brick. You're pretty quick with that. A brick, huh? Um, which is stronger? Which is tougher? A brick or a person? Come on, this, huh? Yeah, the, the brick thing. Well, I don't know. I could hit this brick as hard as I could, and it wouldn't hurt the brick, would it? But if the brick would hit me, ooh, <laughs> that'd be bad. So bricks are nice. They're, they're strong, they're tough, they're pretty heavy, and we use them to build things. We build walls, we build houses, we build churches. This is a brick that's just like 
outside the church. They're stacked up. These walls here are made of solid brick. They're like this thick. It's incredible. This church is tough. It's been here over a hundred years and it's going to be here a lot longer. But what would happen if there were like a, an earthquake, big earthquake? We don't have earthquakes in this part of the country. But if we had an earthquake, what would happen, you think? Pretty much, yep, yep, everything was going to and you would have just a big pile of bricks. All the bricks would be here, but would the church be here? It's just a pile of bricks. Yeah. Yeah, it was, a, it was, they were in a church shape, but now they're in a shape of a pile. You know, probably like the potatoes you had for breakfast, huh? Yeah. Um. But are bricks really the church? No. What is the church? What? The people. I know. Look around out here. These are the people that make up the church. Every church is made up of people. And when we build a building out of bricks, what do we put between the bricks still? What goes between the bricks? The gooey stuff. Exactly right. I, I couldn't explain it better. Um, some might call it mortar, but I'm going with gooey stuff. And the gooey stuff does what? Yep, makes holds it all together. So, you know, some kid doesn't come along and just push it over. Nope, we use the gooey stuff, which dries hard and holds it all together. Um, but if all these people are really the church, what holds them together? God. Don't say gooey stuff. God. God. I like to think Jesus, because, you know, Jesus is here with us, holding us together. And while I said that, you know, the brick is tougher than me, definitely, with Jesus holding us together, we're tougher than anything. We, as a church, if we have Jesus in our hearts, holding us together, we can do anything. And that is wonderful. So, let's pray. Holy God, we are thankful to be bricks in your great kingdom. May everything we do, we do for you and with one another. And all the children of God said, Amen. I like y'all's boots. Okay, go back. I'd ask for waffles next time. Hold out. You can touch the brick, yeah. Ooh. And then after church, it goes back down to the basement where it belongs. Back in 2014, for spring break, my wife and daughter and I traveled to Paris, the, the one in France, uh, not Tennessee. And one of the first things we did when we arrived in that city was to go and visit Notre Dame Cathedral. Notre Dame is located on the Ile de, Cit Ile de la Cité, which is an island in the Seine River, right there in the heart of Paris. And it just happened that while we were there in 2014, Paris was celebrating the 850th anniversary of that famous house of worship. Twice that week, we visited Notre Dame with all the things to do in Paris, we had to go back. We simply couldn't take it all in in one tour. We also spent a lot of time outside the building just marveling at its architecture. And we recognized standing there that we were looking at one of the great buildings of the world, religious or otherwise, but also a place with an enormous history. We marveled at the flying buttresses, the stained glass windows, the statues and the gargoyles, of course, the great organ and the bells up in the tower, and so much more. 
Notre Dame has played a central role in the history of France. It has witnessed wars and revolutions, the coronations and funerals of royalty. It, it simply oozes with history and meaning. Now, I want you to imagine that you are there with my wife and daughter and I back in 2014. We're standing there outside looking up at the cathedral, commenting on its magnificence, the size, the stonework, the carvings. And while we're standing there, and remember, you're there with us, somebody walks up to us and they stand right in front of us and then they proclaim to us with rather convincing authority and in English, you know, in five years, this will all just be a pile of rubble. And what would our response be? I mean, we would likely look at this person with incredulity because that makes no sense, does it? Notre Dame is 850 years old. It has stood the test of time. It is an icon of the Western world, and it is loved by all. It would never become rubble. That's just inconceivable. So anyone who would make this claim, they're either running a scam or they're just not firing on all cylinders. It's, it's just not right. So either way, whatever the case may be, our group kind of glances at one another and we quietly agree that it's just best if we move on away from this person. So we do. We walk away pretending to be extremely interested in that landmark there and hopefully they won't follow us. However, what I ask you to imagine there is exactly what happens in our scripture reading today from the Gospel of Luke. Except that the place of worship is not Notre Dame, but it is the great temple in Jerusalem. And the person making that wacky prediction is not some stranger, but Jesus. We find this account here at the end of Luke's gospel. Jesus has led his disciples to Jerusalem for what would be his final visit to that great city. And he is with his disciples, and they are standing in the courtyard of the great temple up on the Temple Mount. And Jesus and those with him, they're looking at the temple, and they're admiring its magnificence and splendor. And no doubt, no doubt there were some among Jesus' followers for whom this was likely their first trip into the big city. Remember, most of them were from Galilee, which makes them pilgrims, but also tourists. It's only natural that they would stare with awe at this incredible structure that they had only heard about. And as they look, and as they comment, and they admire it, and they look at the massive don't work. Jesus says to them, as for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left standing upon another. All will be thrown down. This temple, this temple, Jesus is telling them, will become nothing more than a pile of rubble. The temple that stood in Jerusalem in Jesus' day was, in fact, the second temple. The first had been constructed by King Solomon in the 10th century B.C., and that temple had been the home of the Ark of the Covenant, and it had been destroyed by the Babylonians in 587 B.C. The second temple was built about 70 years after the destruction of the first, and we can read about its construction in the book of Nehemiah. The second temple underwent a massive renovation during the reign of King Herod, and Herod spared no expense in this project. It was really a vanity project on his part. He doubled the size of the Temple Mount. He rebuilt or replaced every part of the temple, including its massive foundation stones. He adorned the interior with gold and cedar and fine gems. The renovation was completed about 10 years before Jesus was born, and it was one of the larger construction projects of the time. It was a marvel of the world. Tragically, 
in the year 70 AD, 40 years after Jesus' crucifixion, the Romans destroyed the second temple as they were putting down a Jewish rebellion. Just as Jesus had foretold earlier, the great temple was reduced to rubble. So in our reading from Luke, when those around Jesus hear him say that this temple, this magnificent structure will be destroyed, they ask him, well, when's this going to happen? What, are, what will be the signs that we will recognize it? But Jesus won't answer these questions. In fact, he's already said on more than one occasion that no one knows the day or the hour, and it's not his place to lay out any timeline of events. Instead, he warns them, saying, Beware that you're not led astray, for there will be many who will come in my name and say, I am he, but they're not. They will say, The time is near, but it's not. Don't follow them, because no one knows the time. And he goes on to say, When you hear about wars and insurrections, don't be terrified. These things must take place, but the end won't follow them immediately. There will be nation fighting nation, kingdom fighting kingdoms. There will be earthquakes and famines and plagues and dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But that's not the end. And he warns his followers that they're going to be arrested. They're going to be persecuted. They're going to be dragged into prisons and synagogues. They will be brought between, before the kings and the governors because they proclaim Jesus' name. Because of Jesus, because of their faith, they will, be, they will suffer. That must have been a sobering moment for the disciples to hear all of this right there. They they had traveled to Jerusalem with Jesus to celebrate the Passover feast. They didn't expect this. And he is there standing in front of them, standing in front of the temple, telling them that the temple is going to be torn down and they're going to be persecuted and rejected. And while this sounds like it must be the end, Jesus then adds these words. This will give you an opportunity to testify. Testify? Testify to what, I'm sure they wanted to know. But they learned that they can take their persecution and use it as an opportunity to testify to the life of Jesus, to his message, to the gospel, to God's promise of salvation in our lives. And if the followers of Jesus are anxious about what they're going to say when they testify, he says, don't be. I will fill you with the wisdom and you will need, that you will need to out-argue any opponent. And in the process, you will gain your souls. As one theologian puts it, writing about this passage, he says the people with Jesus had a choice. They, they could take Jesus' words as a warning, and they could begin preparing for the end times. They could just hunker down for the terrible days to come and do nothing, just protect themselves. Or they could, as this theologian writes, chuck all of that and hear these words as an invitation to live now by faith and by hope. And living by faith and hope will, as Jesus said, give them the opportunity to testify to his name. For us, maybe now is the time to testify. Maybe now is the time to share the gospel with our community. I know that some of you feel a heightened anxiety about our congregation. You look around on Sunday and you don't see as many people as there were two years ago. And you worry that our church is maybe dying and that the end is near. And as Jesus said, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. I personally 
can also see that there are fewer of you than there used to be, and that while that distresses me, I've also learned not to become overly worried about the future of the church. The church is remarkably resilient, isn't it? Throughout history, the Christian church has faced far worse than this. It has survived for 2,000 years. It has prospered for 2,000 years. As Mark Twain wrote when his obituary was published and he wasn't dead, the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. I think we can always say that about the church. The body of Christ is not dead. The church has survived wars and plagues and scandals and much more. And the church survives, not because of us, but because of the gospel message and the power of the Holy Spirit moving among us. In the church, we have something unique, something special that you won't find anywhere else in the world. And if we choose to be a welcoming community of disciples of Jesus Christ, continually demonstrating God's reign, then we will survive. We will flourish if we can testify to the power of Christ in our lives, we will flourish. In 2014, I visited Notre Dame. And five years later, the building was rubble. On the evening of April 15, 2019, a fire ignited in the attic of the cathedral, likely starting in a short from some wiring. The fire quickly spread and gutted the structure. We all watched horrified at the, vid at the videos we saw on the news. But the church cannot be kept down. Almost immediately, work began to rebuild Notre Dame as donations poured in from around the globe. The project will take years to complete, and the world is cheering it on. And one day, I hope to revisit that landmark and observe the resurrected church. In matters of faith, we always have a choice. We can bewail our misfortune and hunker down waiting for the end, or we can choose to stand up and testify to the world the glorious message of the gospel. We tell of Christ's love for each of us, a love that brings us closer to God, the gooey stuff that holds us together, the love that builds up the church. So I say to you, testify. Amen. I stand.
remain standing as we affirm what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. God of our lives, let us remember those seeds of love, hope, grace, and peace which we carry in our hearts and souls so that in remembering, we would offer our gifts to you and pray that what we give will do your work in this world. Amen. Your offering will now be taken.
Let us once again open our hearts to God in prayer. Let us pray. God of creation, you made us and all that we see. In the beginning, you reached out and you grasped hold of chaos. You gave it a shake and new heavens fell out, brimming with life. A new earth, teeming with life, came into being. And you made us your children. And you hold us in your heart. And you listen to our words. And you hear our dreams. You shape our lips. You loosen our tongue so that we might testify to your kingdom. A place where enemies are no longer enemies. Where weapons become tools for growing crops. Gracious God, you are indeed the spirit of wisdom in our lives. And so again, we ask that you open us up so that we might trust without fear. Help us discern our call to faithfulness in all that we do and teach us that we can be made known to the ends of the earth all that you do for us and the way that you save our lives. Holy God, you are truly the one who makes us new. You heal our wounds. You fix that which is broken. You offer us salvation, and we give thanks. As we gather on this day in worship and praise, we come before you with many prayers. We continue to pray for all of our veterans, for those serving in the military, for those who have given their lives in action, be with these souls and these people and their families and lift them up. We also pray for our nation this week following an election. There are those who are rejoicing in wins, those who are deflated with losses. But may we put aside all differences and work together as one people. We pray for those involved in the protest against the government in Iran where over 300 people have died so far, 14,000 have been detained. May that nation find peace. We pray especially for the farmers in West Africa where floods and droughts have created massive food shortages. May we continue to seek out ways to distribute food fairly and equitably so that none may go hungry. We continue to pray for the people of Ukraine as they fight war against Russia. We pray for the people of Afghanistan, especially the women and girls in that country, that they may find freedom. Holy God, these are but a few of our many prayers. And we give thanks that you are there to hear them all. And as we go through our week, let us do so with the words of Jesus on our lips, the words he taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and forevermore. All the people said, Amen. Amen.